machine learning in general, what is it? People have been hearing that term all over, but what is it practically? I'll tell you a funny story. Just yesterday, I was coming back from Mexico City teaching exactly that at a big company there. And there was a, a guy uh, right next to me uh, who was watching my screen, and my screen was all about this. I was reading a book on deep learning, TensorFlow. Finally, he said, this is some deep stuff you're doing there. And I asked him, what are you doing? He said, I'm a firefighter right next to where you are. Uh, and, and I asked him, where's the connection? Well, what are we doing of the same? If you see a computer being burned, will you save it? He said, yes, and so we found something, something similar. But he, he, he heard about this. He heard about that today's uh, the phones are smart. He heard about that the software is smart. He's a user of the software. Everybody is. Uh, Microsoft, their primary log is that every business is a software business. So that's what people are expecting today. They are expecting that somehow the software will be smart. Even if they don't know what that means, but they expect the results. And very soon they will demand that even enterprise software should be smart. Usually you know that uh, client facing software, your phone, that's great. As far as I don't want to mention any of the softwares. Now people want that their software, their accounting software, their whatever software they use should be getting smarter should know about them. So that's what the whole thing is today, talking about more and more intellect put into the software. The actual progression started quite a long ago. That, that uh, gentleman is already not in this world. He invented the term. He said that, what do we call machine learning? That's where we do not program the computer with exact rules, but instead we give him the data and it comes up with the rules on its own. One example how that can be observed is the self-driving cars. You could basically take this approach, uh, read the driver's uh, manual <clears throat> and program all the rules you find there. Or you could put the computer right next to you in the car and let it record the scenery at 16 frames per second and the, your reactions. And then let it uh, mull over the data and figure out how to drive. So this is the second approach we're talking about. We're learning from the data. It went through many stages. Initially, people were trying to uh, do exactly that first approach, reading the rules and then implementing them in the code. But eventually the approach that has won, definitely by now, is you give it all of the data and then it figures out what to do on its own. So that's the approach, approach that people used to do and what I want to talk about is a bit more in detail so that you know exactly how that works. Okay. That's what people used to do, they used to do that kind of code and that's what people do now. They're saying here is a bunch of emails and that is good email. Here's, we call it ham. And here's a bunch of emails and that is spam. And the way to acquire all these collections is not all that hard. You know, you can take the Enron data set that's public and start there. And then you can also find many million spam messages by planting your address or specific address into a well-known spam house. So you can get the data. Usually it is a big question, how do I get the data? But in this case, as I described, you could do it. And then you run certain algorithms that are called classifiers that will let you make sure that that email that you see right now, it's so much like all the spam emails that you would classify it, that's also spam with the maybe 99% probability. So let's look at the uh, uh, the approaches, translations, for example, what they used to do is do the rules. What they do now is they train what is called a neural network. And that neural network is matching phrases to phrases. It imitates understanding on a higher level than it used to be. So let's look at that example. Uh, one is not what he is for what he writes, but for what he has read. That, that's not such a great translation, what's the original, 
uno no es lo es por lo que escribe, sino por lo que ha leído. So that is striking because it is a great thought. And the new translation, you're not what you write, but what you have read. That sounds much better. How did they do this? That's exactly what I want to show you. The end results are well known. People recognize faces. People recognize cats and dogs. That's one of the very popular, funny enough, but cats are uh, the winners in these competitions in the sense that um, usually people look for cats, not dogs in those competitions. And that gives them a, a simple but effective way to, to win the competition. So let's look at exactly how that happened. In the 60s, people were already playing with this. In fact, that's an important part of history because as you will see, AI was sometimes very popular and then very unpopular. The last cycle uh, happened uh, just six years ago when it became again very, very popular. Now AI is the perfect word. If you want to succeed in business, you call yourself an AI-based, let's say, vacuum cleaning. And, uh, and, and that, that's a must today. So today it's this way. And by the way, in, in doing this, in changing the popularity, it was always rebranding itself. You may have heard about expert systems in the maybe 80s. That was all the range, all the rage. Uh, now it's all about AI and the word AI is back again. So why? What's the reason? Here is the reason we're coming to this hardware progression. Here's what happened. People used to write uh, code and that code would work very well on something called CPU. You probably heard that every computer has a CPU inside. Then what happened is that people were playing games. 30% of all of the waking time of humanity is spent playing games on the computer as opposed to games in real life. And so uh, they, need, they needed a very good processor for that to render all of this. This is the GPU, graphical processing unit. And suddenly people realized that they have invented not just a gaming station, but a very powerful computer called GPU. They are very popular today, especially if you do things like Bitcoin mining or related stuff. So we see that hardware is also changing. And then Google invented something else. They said, here is a good learning library, <coughs> something that will allow you to predict the future better. And it's called TensorFlow. I'll tell you in a second why it's called TensorFlow so that the name should make sense. But then they said, well, TensorFlow doesn't need a regular CPU nor a GPU. What if we create a new computer that will only be able to do this library and machine learning? They did it. So they created a new TensorFlow available, by the way, at uh, Google Cloud. And disclaimer, I do not work for Google. I really teach lots of stuff. I teach Google equally as well as Amazon. But the end result was that, yes, there is a computer for machine learning today. That's what it looks like. And that's another a few thousand times faster than you, even your GPU. So this is where things right now. We have libraries. We have even the computers to do this. All we need to do is get knowledge to really apply this. I was reading this book, by the way. I know it's a bit informal, but it's OK to do such things. Let me find the book that I was reading. That's the book I was reading that, you know, that guy came up with his uh, comment that that looks like crazy complicated. Let me show you some of the nice, not the code. Don't mind the code, but some of the pictures that will explain what is it that we're doing here. Let's go all the way up. So that's the kind of stuff we we're looking at. Okay, the pictures and they explain exactly how you understand what it is, how you embed the knowledge. We're talking about knowledge embedding. Well, that book is deep and great, but when I teach, I usually try to give you the intuition. And the intuition should be, oh, that's pretty simple, great. So uh, let me show you one of those tools that you can take away with you. That tool is called TensorFlow Playground. <clears throat> I hope, guys, you do ask questions because I'm, as you can see, trying to give you the essential information, trying to guess what you're thinking. It will be very good if you also tell me what you're thinking. So, okay, this is 
that same TensorFlow library, and by the way, the reason it's called TensorFlow is because Tensor is a generalized matrix. We all know matrices. Matrices are what spreadsheets are, right? You are all used to square array of numbers. Well, it turns out you can represent quite a few things as an array of numbers. Okay, someone wrote, oh, oh, uh, let me do this. Another secret is we have a secret channel of communication. Let's see what you ask. Available on AWS, that is great, because that is something very interesting. That's a great comment. I'll get back to that later. Let me show you this, and then I'll make um, talk about TensorFlow. So first of all, why is it called TensorFlow? That's because every object in the world today can be modeled as either a matrix or maybe a matrix with yet another dimension. For example, if I'm talking about gray color images, yeah, I can represent that as a matrix. But if I add the color, that's yet another dimension. So that will be a three-dimensional matrix. How do you call a three-dimensional matrix? Well, you call it a tensor. And from then on, everything is a tensor and it has an order. So a number is a tensor, but the order of one, uh, the zero, zero. And then a vector is also a tensor, but an order of one and so on. Well, so that's how you represent all of the data flow, because what you define in your library <clears throat> is the flow of the data from one place to another before it comes with the model. <clears throat> so here is a Google illustration that stands a flow that works in the browser, and I'll show you the very first experience. Let us say we have those points on the, on the right, they are blue and purple. Blue stands for good guys, purple stands for bad guys. And when a new guy walks in, we need to find out what is he, is he a good or a bad guy? The way to predict this is by representing every guy with the X and Y, X1, X2 positions, and then creating some model that will tell me who he is. That's really a very simple question. I can solve it in one go. So I don't even need multiple new ones. But if I click on solve that problem right here, then you see that pretty fast, it's measuring how fast, it's 120 iterations, and it gives me very low error. The output on the loss is 0.006, that's the error or the loss. The loss because it's the difference between what the real data says and what my model says, there is still a little difference. If I let it go for a little bit more, okay, it will come to less and less here on the right. No, it cannot get better on the test. I'll tell you why. That makes sense not on the test, but on the training loss, yes. So, well, looks like a very simple thing. Well, what's great about this? What's great about this is that deep inside, there is a machine learning library called TensorFlow, and that it will work on much more complicated data sets. I skip this one. That is something I'll let you try. Playground TensorFlow org, and you can do it. But I'm more interested in this one. So here a new machine learning problem is presented to me. Uh, please distinguish between the good guys and the bad guys. What's hard about this problem is that, let's analyze. If you are low on X, if you are low on X2, then you are blue. However, if you are high on any one of those coordinates, let's say here is X1, if you are high on X1, you are bad. If you are high on X2, you are bad. If you're high on both, you should absolutely be bad, right? That all should be purple. So that's an exception. How do you include an, an exception into your machine learning? This is where neural networks are better. This one neuron represents essentially one simple question. Are you good or are you bad? Well, a bit more complex, but approximately like this. Here we have exceptions. So how do we add exceptions by adding neurons? Let's try to add a few and see with these neurons and more capability to add votes and exceptions. And please watch the right. What it's doing, it's pretty much finding the right things, except that it doesn't look perfect. What if we add just one more neuron and replay it again? Wow, right? That, that's perfect. So now we begin to have an intuition into the power of neural networks. They run for a long time, 
they require a lot of training. Here, all the training is happening in the browser, but in the more generic case, it might be a cluster. And in the end, they give you a perfect solution to find out what you're looking for. So that is the intuition that I usually would try to tell people if I were to talk about this. And the power now that comment that it is also available in the AWS, that is a very interesting comment because look at what Google has done. They have put out a library that became extremely popular. Let's compare this TensorFlow library to some other library. And if you want, let's go Google Trends. Put TensorFlow here. And if you have other libraries you want me to compare that to, please tell me. So now it's TensorFlow as a search term. So I'm not sure how, how to set it right, but let's do this. And then one of the terms that I saw was popping up was Python machine learning. So let's compare. Also as a search term. Okay, wow, right? We saw that the minute Google put out this library, it shot up in mentions and it became probably the most the most uh, uh, popular library. And then Google revealed to the world that and here's this hardware to run it. Now, uh, others are faced with a dilemma. If they do exactly what Google has done, they're promoting Google's library. And that's what Amazon had to do. But I really want to know what's their direction. This is something a little bit off the topic, but it's an interesting question. Can you comment, and that's another question, can you comment on how this differs from logistic regression analysis, which also provides a yes or no binary decision? That's a great question. So if we go back to here, that's what we're doing, then you're absolutely right. It does not differ. You can think of one neuron as exactly this. It's, it's an implementation of uh, the logistic regression. So that's not new. It's maybe implemented in a somewhat different way technically, but very similar. What this is different with is that, let's say you have a regular logistic regression, yes or no, and you have a more complicated problem than the logistic regression can solve. So this problem, logistic regression can solve easily, and we did it. This problem, you can still solve it. Since you're asking this question, you probably know a bit more and here I add a couple more predictors, which are just squares of the previous predictors. So for this problem of logistic regression, if I add a couple more parameters, then it will solve that. It's still with one neuron. But for this problem, even uh, more predictors will not help. So one thing that neural networks bring in is that they allow you to kind of ask many different people. A thousand people, all different roles, that's your democracy, and you will come up with the real life situation that you can now model by asking that many people. So that's one thing that neural networks add. Another thing is that again, if you go a little bit deeper, you know you can add more and more predictors. You can add x1 times x2 sign. So once I give you that much capabilities, now you're Neural, uh, now your regular regression analysis is lost for a different reason. You can add so many different predictors that you don't know which ones to add. The neural network can do it on, on its own. It will help you. So it's probably not the best way to do it, but it finds it anyway. So this is why the neural network is different from your previous logistic regression. It includes it as just one use case, but once you add more and more neurons and more and more layers, Let's look about hidden layers. So for that, for example, here's a problem that definitely is out of reach for any kind of logistic regression. But if I add more layers, in other words, it's a vote that passes through two houses. And each house has many people. And so we can come up with a legislation that will hopefully reflect the real life. Maybe not, maybe not that easy. I usually give this to, to people you see, I confused it by giving it maybe too many choices. It's trying. You can see it's trying very hard. <coughs> so I'll let you play with that. That's something that I allow students to play with. All right, that's general talk about machine learning 
and where the things are right now. Then we talk about the use cases, but by now people know all the use cases. They're all around you, right? You say sometimes that this is not the age of databases. It's not the age of search engines, but it's the age of recommendations. By now, people so much don't know what they want with all the choices that even the search engine doesn't completely help them. And instead, you come with machine learning recommendations. So those are the very popular, well-known use cases like credit card fraud uh, and uh, uh, helping you to uh, figure out anything that you can figure out on your own. And I have many companies who are trying to put this into every software product that they run. For example, maybe it's uh, accounting software. And every programmer there, we train them in machine learning so that they can do things like, here are all the accountants that have registered, here are all the users, we'll match them, we'll give them the recommendations. So that's the general trend that today I think I see that you're getting lots of libraries packaged for your use. You have the hardware, if you want very powerful hardware, you can build your applications. And that is something that you are the only one who will be able to do and know exactly. So then we talk about uh, what are software libraries are available, how did that change with the size of the hardware. Uh, but what I wanted to come to is, uh, these are all the choices, these are all the libraries that you could use. So it's, it's within reach of everybody. One thing that is being usually taught in college and in classes is two languages, R and Python, and then those same things in Spark. Because in R, that's a great machine learning library, easy to use out of the box, but limited by the size of your computer. Python, the same way, great library, lots of additional libraries you can find, but again, limited by the size of your computer. On cluster, you can run any kind of sizes. For example, uh, the Facebook face recognition, initial training happened on uh, a cluster of, I believe, a thousand machines, and that ran for two days, and they're able to recognize all faces in the world. Now I want to stop right here, and first of all, if you have any questions, then please ask. If uh, not, then I'm going to the next slide. Then. Very good, let me do this. Let me switch to the next slide deck. And if you missed any of those interesting links, just ask Paul and he will send you that. Let's see, here are the slide decks and it's this one. So what's going on inside? When we're talking about uh, uh, some of that machine learning, then usually you get a problem. A problem is presented to you like this, as a matrix. Now, that's the simplest possible problem in the world here. And what we do here is if you go to a restaurant and very often people leave a certain tip and you usually don't know what tip is expected. So you can uh, ask what other people did, take that data and then uh, use their tips. So here we go through all of that. And I found out that in Mexico, the normal tip is 10%, not, not maybe 15. So once you get this data, you're trying to create a model that will reflect exactly this data. That's the simplest example that we use. But the more interesting and more complicated example is uh, uh, predicting the house pricing. So we'll come to that. Let me, let me show you the house pricing. And you know, the reason I skipped from some of the slides is because that's the whole big course I'm using. Uh, but uh, for a short presentation, I choose specific. Don't, don't worry about me skipping slides because that's out of a complete course. So let's imagine this situation. A friend comes to you and he says, I want to sell my house, what should the price be? That's an important question and he has quite a wide range of prices he can set from zero to a million. So we ask them, uh, what's the parameters of the house? What are they? For example, maybe it's bedrooms, six bathrooms, three and so on. And then we create a model that will reflect exactly this. How can I put some weights on the numbers so that I come up with the uh, pricing? So what is interesting is that whichever machine learning model you use, 
inputs, they are very close. You need this data as input. You will also need the results. They're called usual labels. And the code, if I can come to the same code in R, there is a code in R that says, take all of these parameters, and here is my sales price. So please match, create a model or a formula. What is a model? It's a formula or an algorithm that will allow you to feed the input data, what you decided is the input data, and give you the uh, result, the price. So that was an R. Let's see if we go with uh, another language, what will it look in another language? I'm trying to find another language. That is still R. But if we go with Python, you'll see pretty much the same language, Spark, pretty much the same language. So what is the essence here? Is that we're giving it the data, and we are telling it, please find the model that will reflect exactly this data. And then you go into all different algorithms, the improvements. What else can you do? In real life, you need to remove the noise. The noise can ruin your results. You need to remove some data that is just like the other sorts of data. There may be some statistical variations on your data because think of that. Your real data exists somewhere in the world. What you get is a sample of this data that statistically represents your real data. So you need to take that into account. To make your models really work, work for good sizes, and work for good precision, you need to think of the real life. And, and are you really dealing with the real life? This is where new methods come in. This is where new improvements come in. So uh, logistic regression, then, as you discover, works pretty much the same. That's when you want to find out, is it a yes or no answer? For example, before we predicted the price, the house price. But but now we want to say a yes or no, or maybe one to three. So that's a new method. And basically, when you master this, when you master those two approaches, whether predicting a continuous variable or a yes or no answer, in this case, do we give him credit or no? Other situations that we do in classes, will he get into this college or no kind of situations? So. Uh, when you have the ability to predict a continuous variable like price, temperature, what could that speed after a certain point, time. For example, some of my students, I run a little hackathons. I don't call them hackathons, that's what we used to be. But I'm just saying, invent something, and they invent things like, how long will it take me to get home today? How many minutes? So when you have this, and when you can answer a yes or no question, or good, bad, or ugly question, you're essentially ready for applying this in, in machine learning, applying this to your real life. At this point, I challenge you to think of some machine learning problem that you can implement. Then later on, from here on in the course, there are improvements. For example, that what I showed you was linear regression and logistic regression. Those are two ways of predicting either a continuous variable or a choice variable. But there are more. For example, there is something called SVM that support vector machines. It's a very unusual name, but what it means is that it's a better classifier. From maybe 80s, people were already using that, just not calling it AI, artificial intelligence. And the then came a new method called SVM, 1999. That's when it was published. Oh, sorry, 1992. It's pretty old as well. And it was the king of the hill until 2006, when neural networks have beaten that method. So from then on, neural networks became even more popular. Uh, I want to show you just one more example. So that was R, that was Python. The ideas in, in writing software usually are can I make it palatable to a human? Can my code be understood by somebody else? Because as uh, the designer of C language said, he said, it's not that hard to write code that computers will understand. It is much harder to write code that humans will understand. So what I wanted to show you, therefore, is uh, what does that look in this machine learning library called TensorFlow, right? 
I think then you'll get from the very beginning to the very end in just that one quick webinar that we're doing. So let me give you the very first example of uh, the first program in TensorFlow, and you will see that that's also not very hard. So let me find the very first example that will pretty much explain to you how that works. That's what you end up. You can find out and you can say, oh, that is a zebra by a vehicle in the safari. That's what you will be able to do. Uh, but as the very, very first example, is you install it. And today things are so easy that we just say pip install. And then you run the very first program. Let's look at this one now. Let me make it bigger so that you can see it. So here's what you do is a regular hello world. And anybody who programs knows how to do hello world. The difference is this. First of all, I'm creating the first word, but I'm using TensorFlow. You see import TensorFlow STF, that gives me the TensorFlow. Then I'm creating the first constant. The constant is hello. So that's a regular string, nothing unusual about this. Then the world, another string, nothing unusual about this. Then hw is h plus w, that will be hello world. However, I'm in machine learning environment, which means that I first define what needs to be done. So this doesn't get executed. It's a definition of what has to be done. When I really want to do this, then I need to look around. What kind of hardware do I have? Do I have a GPU? Do I have a TensorFlow TPU? Do I have the regular code? The next question is, even if I know which hardware and have the right libraries, then can I optimize that further? So here, there's nothing big to optimize. Two strings come together. But in the real world, it can be pretty complex. The magic is in these two lines. You're saying open an execution session, create that part of the execution graph graph that's because you were dealing with the tensorflow flow is how my data flows through the graph of those operations that's technically what is going on here so i'm opening that session that session will be as smart as to know what hardware is available what can i do and then it will run these operations inside of that session and then we'll print the result so at first you might think well that's over complicating things right but then if you step back, you will realize that's just a simple example of saying hello world. In the more complicated example, it can be any kind of learning that I do here, any kind of learning that I do here. That's a combination of these two. And then indeed, I do need a session to parallelize that, execute it on a thousand machines and apply it depending upon what hardware I have on each machine. So this is what that same example would look in TensorFlow. I already showed you some of the examples in R and Python, and now you can see that the language itself doesn't matter much. Which one do you use? The one that you like, the one that you know most, and the, the end result is prediction of the future. So I, I have a friend, he teaches uh, as part-time teaching. He really is the president of uh, uh, Ericsson, right? one of the VP presidents. But he teaches at the Chicago College because he likes doing such stuff. And he then hires those students if they're good. So he said, AI is all about predicting the future. And whoever predicts the future best, that is who will make the most money. So I, I would like to, to stop here and wait for any questions because I think I've covered pretty much the essence of machine learning with all these languages. We are Starweaver. Education you can bank on. For more information, contact us.